Is this, we're good with this? Okay. So uh, thank you guys for, for coming here. Uh, just a little bit about this talk. And uh, there was this awesome trailer about uh, deep learning and that being the wave of the future. But with this talk, uh, we'll be kicking it uh, more like Claude Shannon information theory old school here. So uh, this is uh, the, the fast feature evaluation. It's, uh, it's nothing that's, that's really new. I just don't see it publicized or talked about too much. But yeah, I think when you're dealing in a very high dimensional space, uh, it's, uh, it, it can be really useful. So, uh, so the first, uh, so really purpose, uh, twofold purpose of this talk is one, just to, uh, to demonstrate the, the concept of MCPT and uh, just uh, realize that in, in order to leverage it, you really needed, uh, or we really need some, some good parallelization. And so that's the second part of this is to really showcase the speed advantages of Numba and some, some recent, uh, some recent capability that they've had with the, uh, with the parallel accelerator uh, functionality with, uh, uh, in combination with, with Intel. And the benefits of that that, that you get is uh, that it, it's cross-platform. So, uh, right, working at Dell, uh, working in kind of a Windows environment, uh, being able to leverage, uh, you know, write, write uh, native Python code and then have it LLVM compiled to the to whatever platform you're running on was, was a huge speed up. And there's a blog post uh, from Stan uh, with Anaconda that was from the end of last year that describes uh, more about uh, the parallel accelerator functionality. Okay, so first I wanna give proper credit to the methodology. Uh, there are two books here that are from uh, Dr. Timothy Masters which describes it. Uh, Assessing and Improving Prediction and Classification and Data Mining Algorithms in C++. Uh, if, you're a, uh, if you're a practitioner in uh, building models or putting models into production, uh, I, I highly recommend these books. Uh, there's code uh, available in them, and it's obvious that uh, it's, it's written from a very pragmatic standpoint, so uh, just a, a, lot of, a lot of good information surrounding that. And uh, with both of these books, uh, there's a, a couple of, of topics there that I've, I've listed. So. Uh, again, hi highly recommend those, those books. Uh, also, second, uh, the Numba developers for creating the awesome Numba package, and then the Intel developers for contributing the parallel accelerator functionality to Numba. Okay, so what's our problem, right? Our problem, uh, right, user has a high dimensional uh, data set of independent variables, we'll call that matrix X, and we want to, as fast as we can, uh, and as accurately as we can, uh, identify the variables, we'll say x1 through xn, that have a strong relationship with our dependent variable, and I'll label that y0. So uh, I'll try to uh, provide a lot of visualizations here. Uh, it's, it's Monte Carlo, so, uh, so some of it should be familiar, but just to follow along. Uh, by the way, my talk kind of straddles both on the real world and the open source. So yeah, hopefully you, uh, you get the best of both worlds here. So what are some popular feature evaluations that, uh, that, are, that are currently used by, by most people? So uh, scikit-learn has uh, a, lot of great, uh, a lot of great methods just for, for univariate analysis, uh, the F classif, F, F regression, and also the mutual information as well too. Uh, from a lasso perspective, uh, we can run lasso cross-validation and then select, uh, select the most important variables from, from the model through that process. And then we have our, our boosted decision trees and bagging with random forests, and there's a method that's called Baruta. If you're familiar with Baruta, uh, what I'm going to describe is a very fast method for Baruta, and I'm only going to go over the univariate space versus uh, building out trees and and uh, going from there. So uh, what are the feature evaluation challenges though in a high dimensional space? Three main challenges at play. Uh, one, the time to perform the evaluation can be incredibly costly. Uh, also, the more variables that you have, the uh, likelihood of selecting one of those variables or it showing relevance and it just being sheer random luck is, uh, is going to increase. And then if you put those random luck variables into a model, uh, just by the nature of the, uh, of the algorithm, it's going to look for signal uh, in order to, to create the model. There's the risk of, of overfitting and uh, your modeling noise. So uh, 
proposed solution is, okay, let's narrow that down using, uh, using some sort of method. We're gonna go over Monte Carlo permutation testing. So what is MCPT? Uh, basically, we're going to use a very simple feature evaluation method. So uh, the two that we're going to talk about here are uh, mutual information and uncertainty reduction. Uh, we have our array, our dependent variable array, and we're going to create uh, k random permutations of that. So I've labeled that as uh, you know, yp for permutation and then uh, one through, through k uh, of those arrays. Uh, we're going to uh, calculate uh, the information measures between all of the, uh, the independent variables and the original dependent variable, and then uh, each of the independent variables, and then each one of the permutations. Then we're gonna compare our actual information measures to those which we had from uh, the, uh, the random permutations uh, that, that we made of our, our dependent variable. And then finally, we're gonna quantify our confidence in observing the, uh, the, the actual dependent variable information over what we, known to, uh, what we know to be uh, random information measures. And there are uh, two, uh, two confidence measures that uh, I'm going to go over in this talk, and then there's a third one that I'm going to demonstrate uh, with some of the examples. Don't have time to go over that one. Uh, but uh, I will provide a GitHub repo that has all of the code uh, showing, uh, showing this, this methodology at the end. Okay, so I, I like to visualize kind of what's going on here, so I wanna uh, step through that. Again, from one of the earlier slides, we had our X matrix with our uh, X, lower, lowercase x, uh, independent variables. Uh, we have our dependent variable array Y0. And we have our two information measures which leverage, which depend highly on the concept of entropy. So uh, in my formula for entropy here, you'll notice a uh, lowercase i. So what that means, I've I added a couple of asterisks here, is uh, I'm really on this talk going to be focusing more on continuous variables and being able to, uh, to bend those. And so, uh, so again, is a fast feature evaluation method, not a perfect feature evaluation method, but I think there are some uh, things at the end of the talk that I'm going to discuss about how we can actually expand this to, uh, to high cardinality categorical variables and being able to combine those, uh, the, the, being able to get estimates for mutual information between those types of variables and continuous variables as well too. So our formula for, uh, for mutual information, pretty standard. And then something that I hadn't really uh, heard about too much, but it's uncertainty reduction. And the formula for uncertainty reduction is, uh, right, is, on, is on the slide here. And so if, if you actually look, it's uh, the mutual information divided by the entropy of our dependent variable. Okay, so what, is, what does this actually mean? This actually is going to tell us, right, if we, we look at, at what, uh, right, the Venn diagram of, of what mutual information actually accounts for. It's that area in the middle, like how much of that area in the middle actually encompasses uh, the entire entropy of, of Y, right? So, uh, so this is a, a method that actually provides some uh, dependency on the, uh, on the dependent variable to just, to just regular mutual information. So the visualizations of the information calculations, right? We have our, our column, Let's, we're gonna start off with X1. We have our, our dependent variable array. And from that, right, we're going to create our, our info array. And that info array is going to be all of our actual, uh, our actual information measures from our independent variables and our dependent variables. So, Okay, I, we're just going to step through, right, each one of the columns and we're going to be populating that array. Okay, at the end, right, each element of info is going to be an independent information calculation. So this is where we're going to, right, talk about parallel accelerator, right, we can absolutely do all of this in, in parallel. Okay, going to the, uh, the, uh, the permutation matrix, uh, we still have our original matrix for our independent variables. Uh, now we're going to create a, a new matrix that's going to have all of our, our random information measures from the permutations of our uh, YP matrix. 
And again, just from a visualization perspective, we're able to step through now column by column, populating this matrix. And there are a lot of calculations at the end, right? Now each element of our info P is also an independent calculation. So uh, again, awesome opportunities for parallelization. At the end, we're gonna combine our, our array that has our actual information measures with our matrix of our information measures from the permutation of our dependent variable, which we know to be random. And we're going to draw confidence measures from these. So the two confidence measures that uh, we're gonna go over, the solo p-value and the unbiased p-value. So solo p-value is where we are just looking at the actual information measure, and then we're looking at all of our random, uh, from, from the random permutations, uh, the information measures uh, YP1 through uh, YPK from, from uh, our original X variable, and we're going to say, okay, what is the proportion of times that our original information measure is less than our permuted information measures? Okay, so why, why less than? Well, our null hypothesis is that our our independent variable is worthless, right? It is, uh, it's, it's no better than random. So if it's actually less than, then that supports our, our null hypothesis. It's if, it, if it's greater than, then uh, it helps refute our, our hypothesis. So the basic premise of this, right, is if a variable can't perform better than a known uh, random relationships, it's probably not worth considering. I understand probably here, <laughs> right, because this doesn't take into account bivariate or multivariate relationships, right, where two different variables can actually uh, combine to, to, to be very informative. I think a great example of that is uh, obesity, uh, determine obesity, and you're looking at, at height and weight, right? When you combine both of them together, then that's going to be more important than just looking at height or just looking at weight. So uh, currently, uh, the code that I have in my GitHub repo only is uh, looking at uh, univariate relationships, but in uh, Dr. Master's text, uh, he has some code for bivariate. I'm looking at putting that in there as well, too. Now, uh, the unbiased p-value is actually something that's a little bit different, and it's a little, and, it, and it's more, con, it's a more conservative measure, right? So we're now, since we've done all of these, what we know to be, you know, ran, basically random uh, permuta or, uh, random information measures from the permutations. Uh, we're now going to, rather than just going across, we're going to take the largest random uh, information measure that we know, and we're gonna say, that, okay, that, this is gonna be the gold standard for each one of that. So, so applying uh, what, those, uh, what those random information measures are from each one of our dependent variables. So find the largest information measure uh, across all the dependent variables for each one of the, the permutations. And then we're, it's kind of the same, same idea, right? Now we're going to look at is the actual information measure less than that in order to, uh, uh, that, that kind of max uh, random information measure array. So that, that was something a, a little bit different, right, that I hadn't been used to, but we're now, like, it's basically going to be help strengthening our cause for is this variable worthwhile or not. So most of what I described is embarrassingly parallel, isn't it? Yes. So. That's what uh, we wanna go through now and kinda walk through this, the, the implementation summary of this. So we have our NumPy matrix with our independent variables. Uh, we have our NumPy array of, our, of the dependent variable. Okay, I'm going to discretize uh, both the NumPy matrix and the NumPy array, and this can be parallelized. Uh, now the idea in order to get a, an, an even or as, as most of an, uh, an unbiased uh, information measure as possible is we want to uh, equally bin uh, our, our continuous variable. And so this is similar to, uh, to cut or qcut in pandas. Oh, and uh, uh, Dr. Masters provides an algorithm. I, I've called that Masters cut. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty robust, so uh, I, I like using that. Uh, then I'm going to uh, take that newly bin dependent variable, uh, I'm going to permute that k times, uh, and 100 or it, depending on the dimensionality of that, it could be up to 1,000. Uh, 
Well, uh, I'll be running all of my examples uh, via CPU, so I've stuck with, uh, with 100. Uh, but definitely, right, the, the idea of going and using number is it's, it can almost be a simple intercha interchangeable parameter of target equals CPU or target equals uh, GPU, and, uh, and, and that, that code is, is completely convertible. Don't have that uh, working quite yet, but it's definitely on the horizon. Okay. We're going to combine our uh, actual dependent variable with the permutation. And now, right, we're going to do this nested for loop, which actually both can be uh, parallelized as well, too, right? For each variable that's in our NumPy matrix, uh, we're going to calculate the information that measure then for each column in that uh, dependent variable matrix, which we created from step five. So we got, we got three steps here that we can parallelize, and then our last, right, our confidence measures, once we have those, we can parallelize that, too. So. Uh, how many calculations? I, I just, I wanted to throw this out because I thought this was kind of fun. Uh, let's say we have 500 independent variables. Well, the sorting and binning can be parallelized. Uh, then we have our 100 permutations. So just the information measures alone are right around, right, 50,000 calculations. And then inside each calculation, what are we doing? Right, I summarized that up of getting our, our marginal bin pre uh, prevalence, our contingency table. Uh, values and then uh, you know I iterate over each of those in order to uh, to calculate a, the information measure. So, uh, okay. So history of my Python implementation. Honestly, this talk has been probably about mm, three years in the making <laughs> because I have been desperately searching for. Uh, something that could do this as fast as I wanted to do without going into Cython and without having to, uh, to really do some, some custom coding. Uh, has this been possible before this time? Absolutely, but I really didn't want to get into the just, the, the just raw like C code because I did have this idea of, hey, it should, uh, I guess my philosophy is right, if, if if a problem is embarrassingly parallel, then it should be just as uh, parsimonious to implement, right? So whether I want to keep it to a, a CPU or GPU, it shouldn't matter. Uh, I should just be able to, to write it, and it, it should, it should go, go quickly. So my iteration history, I think I first started off with just NumPy and Pandas. I did some nested for loops, and that just took me a long time. I was like, okay, hey, this, this is, this is a, a great thing, but I, I, I just can't, can't scale it. Okay, then I, I dove into the multi-processing with, with Joblib, um, you know, pulled that from scikit-learn, and I was getting a time improvement, uh, but it was spawning multiple processes, and especially like on Windows, right, where there's, there's no forking, <laughs> it was spawn, like it was just that the memory space was exploding, so I really couldn't do large data sets. Uh, now, with NumPy and, and uh, with Numba and Parallel Accelerator, uh, I get LLVM compiled code, so no matter what platform I, I run, all of the functions are being uh, compiled at runtime. Uh, I get multi-threaded parallelization, so the data doesn't get copied out. And uh, with, with just a little bit of work, I can, I can uh, extend to the, to the GPU. So this was, uh, this was Nirvana for me, but in, on, uh, in all honesty, it really has only happened since I would say maybe uh, September, October of last year, when uh, when the parallel accelerator functionality was uh, was added to Numba, so I wanted to provide a couple of code snippets, which are in the the GitHub repo, and just show you what I mean about kind of parsimonious parallelization. So this was for the equal binning algorithm, and uh, there it's kind of like some some stumps here for for other functions that are that are in the library that I have, but if you look really. Uh, there's two things that I've done. I, I've added this parallel equals true parameter, and then I've wrapped that rather with a for loop that's number.p range. That's it. <laughs> uh, like it's so it's so incredibly easy. And uh, the one thing that you'll notice here, I'll just show a sidebar, is I actually transposed the matrix because I noticed I was getting actually a little bit better uh, better performance when it wasn't. Uh, when it was, I guess, Fortran-based rather than, than C-based. So, uh, so it was, it was, the columns turned to rows, and now I'm iterating by each one of the rows. So that's just a sidebar and kind of getting into the weeds with that. But 
Code snippets for my information calculations, same thing, right? So left-hand side, you have my, uh, or you have the, the mutual information uh, that's parallelized, and I'm, uh, I'm wrapping that with, you, we saw that nested for loop, that's exactly what I'm doing here, and that's it. Like, yeah, it's, I, now the, the one piece about this that you, you have to know and where Parallel Accelerator can take advantages is I know as, as a programmer that each one of my calculations are independent. Right? If you're having to, if, if the cells are depending on one another, then the Parallel acceler Accelerator functionality will, will fail, uh, and it'll just go to, to straight Python code. Um, actually, if you wrap it with the no Python parameter, that's where it'll probably, won't even compile. Uh, so that is something to be aware of as you're developing this, is uh, like, it does still put the onus on you to say, hey, uh, can, can, are, are all of my calculations independent? Okay, well then let me, you know, let me structure my data structures in a way that, that I can take advantage then of, of the, the parallel accelerator. Confidence values, same thing. It's, <laughs> right, parallel equals true, wrap it with uh, number.p range. Uh, that was for the solo p-val calc. Uh, the um, getting my max information, I can do that as well too, right, because uh, I'm looking at each one of the different columns and what that max value is. I uh, can write that in there. And then uh, my unbiased p-value calc as well too. So, uh, so again, if it, it's like, if you have things to parallelize, this is, this is awesome. Hey, I wanna go through a few examples. And the examples, uh, all of the times that I'm giving here are, are being run on this laptop. So. Uh, the processor is, uh, is what it says there, and it's uh, 16 gigs of RAM. So uh, not, uh, not, not the biggest, uh, but still we can, we can do some analysis on some, some, some pretty large data sets because I'm not doing data copying. Okay, so uh, I apologize if this is a little bit small at the back of the room. I never know how big uh, these are going to be, but uh, hopefully the, uh, um, Hopefully it's, it's clear enough and, and you can still see kind of what's going on here. So uh, just to start off, right, uh, we wanna make sure that this method is returning what it should, right? It should return the variables that, uh, or the, re return the, the features that seem to be most related to our dependent variable. So in this case, right, we're starting off with uh, just 50,000 observations and 200 columns. Uh, I'm going to uh, impose, uh, relationship on here, right, by taking the first two columns and just making them sums of other columns in the data set. So the first column will be sum of column two and three, and then the second column will be the sum of column four and five, and then my dependent variable is actually going to be the, uh, the sum of those first two columns. So if this thing works correctly, oh, and we're gonna run for 100 times, and I'm, I'm binning uh, just, I'm, uh, putting in uh, each of the continuous variables into three bins. So if this works correctly, then we should see that the top, what is it, uh, six variables should show up as being relevant. So when I run that, uh, again, just to give you an idea about how fast this goes, uh, the, the screen univariate function, uh, 1.52 seconds, but that is my first pass, and since this is being compiled on the fly, when I run it again, Right, my, my real time is, uh, is 1.29 seconds. So it takes uh, you know, several tenths of a second to do the compilation the very first time you go through it, but then afterwards, right, it's, it's ready to go for your, for your problem. Uh, now the results, uh, there's some pandas code uh, that I did just to make things a little bit clearer about what was going on. But if you do see, right, these top six variables are exactly what should be returned here. Uh, we have uh, the sum of two, three, and sum of two, four, which are the, the most, right? And then uh, the random two through five, they're, they're, they're less there. Um, now our solo p values all, all uh, show up as being the lowest value possible because included in that solo p value is the actual information measure itself. And our unbiased p value shows up as being uh, relevant as well too. The one thing that you'll see is on the unbiased p value, right, all those are extremely high. Okay, example two. 
We'll go to a uh, Friedman data set. So if you want, this is a synthetic data set that's, that's used uh, you know, quite frequently for modeling, feature evaluation, things that, uh, that as well too. If you're not familiar with it, uh, just, this is in scikit-learn, and the formula for that is, at, uh, is, is there. Again, if we look at which of those variables should show up as being relevant, we're looking at right, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, right? So the top five should show up as being relevant. Um, where are we at from how, much, uh, you know, how many observations? 100,000 observations. This time I kicked up the features to uh, 1,000 features, right? So, uh, so quite a few. Um, and how long did it take that to run? So 100,000 observations, 1,000 features, completely parallelized, uh, took 13 seconds. Again, on my laptop, pretty fast. And uh, the results of this are, uh, are, are here. So the top five are all showing up with, uh, with relatively higher uh, information values. Our solo p-values and our unbiased p-values are both low. In this example, however, I do want to point out this little guy right down there. Uh, when you look at what that information value is, when you just look at the solo p-value, this looks as saying, hey, if we just looked at that particular row, he says, hey, this, this guy is important, right? But when you take the, the broader approach, right, when you look at all of the known random values, uh, our unbiased p-value is actually uh, higher and it says, yeah, we actually, that, that would have you know, absolutely been, been a red herring had we just looked at that one confidence value. Okay, uh, again, synthetic. <laughs> uh, make hasty is uh, one that's more uh, dealing with classification. So you can see the bins on here. I'm going five and two. Uh, there are, for this one, right, there are only 10 variables. So that's why I ratcheted up the number of observations to a million. Uh, still, still keeping with 100 reps. And uh, if you notice on this run, right, what, what should be happening here? Well, okay, the sum, um, so the dependent variable is based basically, right, on the sum of all of the independent variables. So if this works, right, we should see that uh, everything should show up as being relevant, right? All, all, the, or the, all the features should uh, evaluate as being relevant when looking to compare to the dependent variable. How long does that take? Okay, uh, 6.52 seconds. So uh, again, a million observations, only 10 variables, uh, still pretty quick. And our, our results that we get uh, absolutely do show what, you know, what should be the case. Okay. Just for kicks, right, I wanna do a purely random one, so this should not return anything. Uh, but I also, be, uh, because of this, I, I wanted to increase the number of observations, also increase the number of, of variables. So 500,000 observations, 500 variables uh, are uh, binning. This is, uh, you know, into five and three bins, 100 reps. So in this case, right, ratcheting it up, uh, it does take a little bit longer. It takes a minute and 26 seconds. But again, when you're thinking about the size of the data and I'm doing this on my laptop, this is, this is pretty awesome. And uh, what do we get here? Uh, we get a bunch of nothing, but we do get right a couple of those same observations that would have been uh, that that would have been false had we just looked at that solo p value, right? Those first two, and then that one in the middle, right? It's right at that p value level where we might be thinking, hey, we should apply this to our model. But then that unbiased p value calculation uh, provides a little bit of strength for for us in in terms of our evaluation. And uh, I wanted to show the resource manager from my Windows laptop. And you see on the right-hand side, all of those uh, threads are, are uh, tapped out. So I see that and it almost brings a tear to my eye. Like I, I, just, I love being able to completely utilize the hardware. And a lot of that is a huge functionality of the parallel accelerator. So it is very, very efficient and fast in terms of what it's able to do and leverage all the resources that you have. Okay. Let's get to an actual data set, right? So from this, uh, I wanted to look at something that would be pretty quick. Uh, this came from a crowd analytics competition uh, that was held at the beginning of this year, and this uh, was related to the Australian Open Tennis Tournament. And what it used, it used Hawkeye data, which was uh, spatial-related data of where players 
and balls were on the court, uh, what the velocity of some of their shots were. And the goal of it was to try to determine whether a shot was going, was, was, uh, was determined by, by people who do scoring, whether it was a winner or whether it was an unforced error or a forced error. Right? So a forced error means that the shot was so good that the other player really didn't have a legitimate play on the ball. The unforced error was more just like, it was just a bad shot. Uh, everything was set up for the player to put it back in play, but you know, either hit it wide or hit it long. So based on some of the Hawkeye data, you, uh, you, you we're, we're trying to, to be able to do this. So, uh, so a friend and I actually competed in this competition, uh, did pretty good. I think we got it, it finished up in the top 10 somewhere out of about seven or 800 uh, teams. So, uh, so that's why I knew this data set well enough that I was like, hey, let me try it on this to, to see, uh, see, what can ha um, see what this comes up with. So, uh, so from this case, right, I'm taking the training set from the men's competition that they had. Uh, I'm binning the continuous variables uh, into 10 bins, and they're, uh, the Y bins, right, there are three options, the winner, the unforced error, and the forced error, and 100 reps. Uh, this is a small data set, so it, you know, only 5,000 observations and 24 columns, but we can still see the speed advantage from that. Uh, and so when I did that, it was 219 milliseconds. Now there is one thing that's different about this function call than all the other function calls, and that is this CSCV folds parameter. So this is one that I really didn't go into, uh, but it is discussed in that data mining text from Dr. Masters. I actually think this is a, a, a really awesome concept. And what this does is it gives you an information measure and it allows you to compare all the variables against one another uh, in an out of sample fashion. So CSCV stands for combinatorially symmetric cross validation, <laughs> uh, kind of a mouthful there, but uh, it, ba it, it divides your data set up and then takes the, the information measures from your out of sample data across many different folds and, uh, and compares those information measures with the other variables in your data set and you'll see that there's a, uh, there's a p-value, uh, and you compare it against the median uh, out-of-sample information measure of each fold. So when you're doing, talking about uh, like eight, uh, eight folds, right? Imagine, it's, it's somewhat hard to explain, the co it's in the code, right? So if you're really interested in it, uh, you know, consult the, the GitHub repo. But basically, you're taking, uh, dividing your data set up into eight regions, and then you're taking chunks of four, right? Uh, the combinations of chunks of four, and, and so this entire measure, right, you can imagine, okay, eight chunks, uh, combinations of four, there's a, there's a lot of computation that's actually going on with this CSCV. So the fact that it did it in 219 milliseconds uh, even with that few observations, incredibly quick. Now, what does the P uh, less than or equal to median actually tell us? Well, you'll see, right, that there are, are a lot of, of zero values on there. Those are going to be, right, the lower your P value, the more that those are, uh, are, are scoring better than what that median out of sample variable scored, right? So this is a really great way that you're, if you're really wanting to separate the variables kind of into a top and bottom, uh, this, this is a, this is a, a great, great uh, method to look at. And you can see actually that it does, there's almost this, this even dividing line, right? Like there are a lot of zeros that are the, are the strongest and then it jumps from, okay, 0, 2, 0, 2, 0, 8, and then 0.8, right? So if you really are looking for a top and bottom half of your, of your feature set, uh, this is an excellent method to apply. So again, not something that I see necessarily discussed too much in the wild, but yet uh, uh, when, when you're looking at doing, uh, you know, doing this type of feature evaluation, something that you can use. Oh, 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 yeah, let me go back because what you'll notice actually is that all of the solo p-values and pretty much all the unbiased p-values are saying, hey, this variable actually, you know, helps in, in, uh, uh, in, in determining what, what our outcome is. So in this case, yeah, go ahead, if that, you know, applying them all to, into a model wouldn't be bad. And honestly, like, I wouldn't necessarily think that a competition from Crowd Analytics or Kaggle, which only has 24 columns, like, 
like all the columns should matter. So, um, so you know, they, they do and, and they did. Okay, so how to use this? Uh, I think, right, a, a couple different methods. Uh, one, and, and first and foremost, is just, it's where to look first, right? So uh, going back to uh, what Peter had said, right, as far as incorporating Tukey and the EDA piece, right? If you have a ton of variables and you don't know where to start, uh, like how, how can you get to a starting place quickly and at least look at those first top two or three? I wanna make sure that the method that I use is robust because I'm, I, my dimensionality is, is great, uh, but I wanna be able to do it fast, right? I think that's where a method like this comes in is uh, from an EDA perspective. Um, also, uh, another thing which is discussed in, in some of his texts is just building a smarter, uh, relatively fast baseline model. So here are a couple of things that have been thrown out, right? If you are looking for uh, p-values below, you know, you, you set your threshold, anything that's below that p-value, you, know, you would apply to uh, like a, an elastic net model. Uh, another benchmark that he gives are, you know, p less than or equal median values that are less, to zero, less than uh, 0 0.2. And, uh, and then if you know that all of those are there, then you wanna stay more on the, on the ridge regression side than on the lasso regression. And so one of the, the recommended uh, uh, prescriptions is just an L1 ratio of 0 0.1 and then uh, the elastic net CV for an optimal um, alpha, which in the GLM net world, in the R world is your lambda. So. Um, if you guys, for those of you familiar with, with the last net. Another one that actually, another usage case that, that I didn't put in this slide that might be interesting is a lot of times uh, when you wanna look at those, like let's say the top half of the most important variables, um, it's, it's for clustering as well too. Uh, you know, if you're, you, you take those top half of the variables, uh, you put them into some sort of unsupervised uh, learning algorithm or clustering algorithm, you cluster on those and then uh, you know, potentially look at, at models inside of each one of those clusters to be able to, if, if you're having to describe your behavior, just more of a, again, a more, more of a structured path to uh, building models or doing the analysis. Okay, what's my future work that I'd like to do? And I said it talked about uh, adding the bivariate screening capability, uh, adding the GPU functionality. Uh, third uh, is porting the scikit-learn um, k-nearest neighbors based mutual information estimation calculation and number. So what this will allow you to do is actually now, and more from a business perspective, right, if you have those, those high cardinal variables, being able to, to, to combine them with continuous, not have to worry about binning or how many bins you wanna do or anything, it's, it's a really nice measure. And that came from a paper, I think, that was somewhere around uh, 2014, but if you look at, at uh, scikit-learn's uh, scikit-learn's documentation on that, there's a reference to that paper there. Now the, the, the awesome part of that is uh, the K&M based uses both ball tree and KD tree algorithms. And uh, there was Jake Vanderplas, who, uh, who Peter showed uh, there as well too. He wrote this awesome gist trying to use Numba to say, hey, it, can Numba be faster than the scikit-learn implementation for a ball tree algorithm? And it, that gist was like two or three years old. And I looked at it and uh, there have been a lot of advances with Numba since then. And so I actually took his, his Numba code, converted it to the parallel accelerator functionality and the no Python functionality. And now we're getting, uh, I was getting speed ups of about 20 to 30% in the tree creation of, um, with the Numba over the scikit-learn Cython version. And then in the querying, right, I was, I was uh, querying all of the points uh, and I can parallelize that, right, because each one of those, those, those queries are, are uh, parallelized as well. I was getting about a 3x speed up in that. So some, some awesome improvements with Numba in the last, uh, I would, yeah, I would say even the last, definitely the last two to three years because that's when he last revisited that. So I'm well on my way to actually doing this right now with, um, I'm trying to, to implement the KD tree algorithm. The one gotcha on this is the object-oriented support for Numba. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm having to go ev to, to pull everything out from an object-oriented perspective and, and, uh, and, and try to, to create these functions that way. But absolutely something when I, that I wanna do because I think from a business perspective, it could be very useful. Uh, memory optimization and then create a package. I will admit I am not a, 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 a 
an expert Python programmer at all. So if some of this interests you and you have experience creating a Python package, please reach out to me because I would love to, to get some assistance with that. Okay, here's uh, the GitHub repo for all the code, and uh, I'll leave it up there if you guys wanna, if you guys need to take a, take a snapshot of that. And um, I do wanna break out and uh, show you, uh, hopefully, this has been on my, on my laptop, and it's on Windows, so that time function really doesn't tell you how much parallelization is going on, and, uh, but under a Linux uh, perspective, you do get uh, an idea because it will tell you, right, the CPU time and then the actual time. So I'd like to break out of, of this, uh, if everyone's kind of taking a picture of it and, and are ready. Uh, just show you, I'm not gonna run through uh, the, uh, the live demo of it, but I will show you the Python, IPython notebook that I have where I've run it on a server that had 48 threads running and, uh, and some of that speed up. So, uh, so let me go ahead and, and break out of that real quick. Okay, so, um, okay, just real quick. Here was the, um, here was the article that I had talked about uh, earlier uh, that, that kind of announced a lot of this. It's, it's really good, so if you, uh, if you like high performance computing, I definitely would re recommend that. Um, uh, right, my GitHub repo, um, so I do have, um, there's not much in, in there. <laughs> Uh, but uh, again, you know, uh, feel free to look at it and uh, uh, contact me again if you have, you have any questions. Okay, so here is the, the, the notebook that I have that shows, okay, how many threads am I, am I working with on here? So, uh, so this one, right, 24 core server, 48 threads. Uh, I'm using this version of Numba. And um, so this was something similar to the very first example that we had where uh, we had the 500,000 uh, observations and the 200 variables. Uh, you can now see kind of what this speed up um, is like, right? So it goes from, uh, you know, 10.2 actual seconds of computation to 658 milliseconds. Um, again, really, really efficient parallelization. And if it doesn't do better, it's probably in my, my coding. It's not <laughs> in the implementation. Uh, another... Uh, another implement or another uh, benchmark here as well too, um, right? 10.3 seconds to 615 milliseconds, uh, uh, and then I wanted to, to scroll to the bottom here where we do have uh, right a larger instance. So 500,000 observations, a uh, thousand variables, uh, and without the CSCV folds, uh, it was a user time of 15 minutes. Uh, down to 41 seconds. So some, again, uh, you're talking about where do I start from an EDA perspective and I have a huge, uh, you know, uh, high dimensional problem. Um, it was really good. Now when we kick in the CV, CSCV folds and we're doing a lot more uh, information calculations, this goes from, you know, a clock time of two hours to six minutes. So um, just as, performance and valuing time, like, this is awesome. <laughs> Again, about several years in the making because uh, I don't know if I could have done this in, uh, you know, just in Cython alone, but man, they've done some awesome stuff with Numba. So, uh, so with that, that's really all that I had. There's about five minutes or so left for questions. So, um, yeah, let me know, know if you guys have any questions. And I believe that there is, oh, uh, Ian might be coming with a, a mic here, but 